Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for January 23rd, 2023. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Improving the Security of Open Source Software Infrastructure. Our presenter is Gader Bloom. Gader is an Associate Professor of Computer Science at University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. His research ex expertise is computer system security with an emphasis on real-time embedded systems. Before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. And we also plan on taking um, questions at the end of the presentation as well. And with that, I'll think I'll hand things over to Gader. Gader, welcome. Thank you, Jeanette. Let's see. There we go. And should be seeing my slides. Yep, look Excellent. Good. All right. So nothing new to see here. So I'm going to dive right into it. Uh, very big, broad overview picture of what really gets me enthusiastic and motivated is cyber physical systems, um, often tied into real-time embedded systems and critical infrastructure. So uh, I think this is DHS NSF sort of definition. Cyber physical systems are engineered systems that are built from and depend upon the seamless integration of computation and physical components. Um, sometimes you'll hear computation sort of as digital um, and RF even, and physical as sort of RF electronic and then physics of interacting with the real world, mechanics. It really spans um, all of the engineering disciplines. And then critical infrastructure uh, is defined and protected, well, defined by the U.S. government and protected by the Department of Homeland Security, uh, 16 critical infrastructure sectors. Um, and, and my focus is really on the sectors bulleted here, the defense industrial base, energy, communications, information technology, and transportation. Uh, up here on the right, I if I have a, a pointer, a laser, I can, there we go. Up here on the right um, is sort of a depiction of how cyber physical systems and critical infrastructure kind of fit in the world. So sensors read from the world software processes, sensors, and um, typically some kind of control loops take care of actuators to interact with the real world. And this is kind of a feedback loop of sorts, often structured uh, as, a, as a closed loop feedback control system. Um, and the software here involves often real-time operating systems and middleware to support application critical infrastructure software, running on top of, um, often on top of microcontrollers or similar types of uh, small scale computers that you don't really see, but they're everywhere in this picture, these pictures down here on the bottom. Um, I mean, I, I would say there's probably millions of computers just in these pictures. <clears throat> and one of the interesting things about working with cyber physical systems and infrastructure is that there's this sort of historical understanding that reliability of these systems tends to grow over time. The longer that you have a system running and it hasn't failed, the more you tend to rely on it. You trust that it's going to keep working. Um, and in a lot of ways, manufacturing and products, this is how kind of humans have been trained to learn how products work. Um, and so you have this kind of traditional bathtub curve in um, manufacturing and uh, product engineering, resilience engineering, where you have this um, failure rate at the start of a product and you burn in or wear in your product. And then you have this really constant kind of failure rate where you want as much time of the service life of your product to be sort of within this um, hopefully low failure rate. Um, and then as uh, physical components wear out, then you start to get more failures. And with digital electronics, we have really, really long, um, I guess, really flat <laughs> bathtubs um, because the, the silicon just doesn't fail 
that often in comparison to moving parts. So in computing systems, we've also gotten quite used to having, you know, once your computer is working, you expect it to work for a long time. Um, and probably most of you, if you've had a computer fail, I would guess the failure was actually the hard disk drive failing. Um, and it was not a digital component, but probably a physical component, uh, a motor um, or the, the position of the magnets, the electromagnets inside that hard disk drive. So we expect that reliability grows. Unfortunately, security, we know, gets worse over time. And so we have this competing kind of pressure of we have these systems, the longer we use them, the more we expect that we can use them, the more we trust them, the more we expect they're going to behave as we want to. And so we want to keep using them. Uh, unfortunately, we also have this problem that the longer we use the system, the more exposure to uh, threats and the more exposure to vulnerabilities there exist and the more opportunities that attackers have to figure out how to exploit vulnerabilities. So we actually have this nice picture here of um, uh, I believe this is a Commodore 64, it looks like. Um, those of you in the crowd may be familiar with. Uh, I actually uh, did have one of these, one of my first sort of computing experiences. Um, and, and it was used in a mechanic shop, auto shop, for 25 years just to, to manage the, the shop uh, floor. So, you know, when, when we find something that works, we love it and we want to keep using it. I would actually bet this is one of the most secure computers that I've ever seen. <laughs> So over time, right, we, we discover vulnerabilities. So Heartbleed was discovered, and it was discovered in 2014 timeframe, give or take, and it affected systems over the span of 2012 through 2014. Um, Heartbleed, if you'll remember, uh, was that open SSL vulnerability. Uh, crack, a Wi-Fi vulnerability, uh, discovered in 2016 timeframe, affected systems dating back all the way to 2006, uh, in theory, right? So we discover these vulnerabilities, we discover how to exploit them um, publicly. We don't really know for sure uh, how long attackers have been able to exploit them, but we know how long the vulnerabilities have existed by looking back at historical uh, evidence of the system itself. Um, shell shock, a series of bash shell vulnerabilities discovered uh, around 2016 timeframe affecting systems from 1918, uh, 1989 <laughs> through 2014. Yes, discovered in 2014. Um, and meltdown. So any computer that had dynamic branch prediction, in theory, um, speculation plus um, uh, fetching caches and virtual memory ha had was susceptible potentially to meltdown style attacks. Um, so we discover these vulnerabilities um, and, and we really don't know they exist. Like the day before the Rohammer attack was disclosed, if you had told me about it, I would not have, like, I, I don't think I would have believed that that was possible. Um, so, like these attacks are, you know, very creative. Um, and they catch us by surprise. And so we want to try to figure out what we can do best to avoid surprise. Um, so it it turns out that when you look at industrial control systems, uh, operational technology, cyber physical systems, those are all kind of synonymous. Uh, the number one source of attack vulnerabilities is the software, so the engineering software. And so um, kind of engineering 101, uh, focus on your bottlenecks, optimize optimize your big problem. So uh, we're going to focus on the engineering software. Uh, networking devices, yeah, those are problems. The SCADA networks are also problematic. Um, and, but as you move down this track, yeah, these are problematic. And, and this is, you know, vulnerability counts. So metrics, security, don't get me started on security metrics. Um, we could have a whole other talk about that. I'm sure several talks about that. Um, not necessarily the best metrics, but, you know, pretty good metrics um, to help you at least guide your engineering effort. So. What am I doing? Uh, my research broadly addresses, like I said, cyber physical systems, embedded system security. Uh, and today we're going to talk mainly about kernel hacking, not in the sort of offensive hacker kind of way, but more in the 
I like to sling code kind of way, and infrastructure security. So uh, kernel hacking, I'm going to talk about the RTEMS real-time executive for multiprocessor systems, and we'll talk about the EPICS experimental physics industrial control system software suite, um, and, and how those also tie into industrial control system security and an NSF funded project that has been going on for, well, longer than I care to admit, but we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> oh, so here it is. So uh, NSF um, funded a project that I proposed on security hardening of scientific and industrial control systems, focusing heavily on the RTEMS operating system and the EPICS middleware for experimental physics. Um, and this project started in 2018 and is still going on today. Um, it was initially envisioned as a three-year project, um, but life interceded. And the focus of this project initially is on adoption of a secure software development lifecycle, security SDLC, in open source communities. That's something that we're still working toward. Um, and it's something that you know, I, I want to promote. Um, but it's also something pretty hard to do in a decentralized way. And we'll talk more about that probably at the end of this talk. Um, increasing confidence and fidelity of scientific data collection right, you, by improving security, improve integrity of your system and reducing risks with misconfiguration of systems. That's like the overarching goals. Um, and initial partners in the proposal and the project uh, included the Fritz Haber Institute over in Germany, Oak Ridge National Lab uh, in Knoxville, Argonne National Lab, um, well, close by in Illinois there. Um, and um, actually, ITER was also um, part of this um, over in France initially. We haven't had too much interaction with them. So uh, what is RTEMS? RTEMS, the real-time executive for multiprocessor systems, is a real-time operating system. Um, and it really focuses on um, sort of providing safety-critical system support, um, but, but not for human safety-critical systems, typically. Um, so, for example, it, it's especially been taken up in the space community for space probes and satellites to operate instruments. So not for manned space missions, but in a lot of unmanned space missions, RTEMS is in use. And then um, for the EPICS project, it's used in a lot of the um, data capture in the uh, accelerators. Um, it's also used in um, some of the big telescopes. My role in RTEMS, I'm one of um, six so-called maintainers, core maintainers, so people who are kind of responsible for guiding the project and making sure that software contributions are coming in and, um, and keeping the quality of the open source project high. I got started in RTEMS as a Google Summer of Code student, um, as well as using RTEMS in some of my PhD research. So I did a port of RTEMS to the first 64-bit processor architecture that RTEMS was supported on. Uh, that was part of my research. I rewrote the thread scheduler. That was part of my Google Summer of Code to make it more modular to help support multi-core embedded platforms. Um, and in in recent research, uh, I've been looking at para-virtualization of RTEMS to have it run within a virtualized environment. Uh, and I also co-authored a textbook about RTEMS with another maintainer, Joel Sherrill, and with um, two people who have used RTEMS in different projects, um, mostly in an industrial setting. So Ting Ting Hu and Ivan Sabario Bertolotti. Um, I do a lot of mentoring of students using RTEMS, and um, current and future work really, I think, is going to focus on verification, um, qualification of RTEMS for, um, for, for meeting standards for flight safety and security. <laughs> EPICS, Experimental Physics uh, industrial control system software suite is open source software that um, helps to make it easier to tie together different kinds of operating systems on different types of computers. So RTEMS for embedded systems, Windows, Linux, 
um, for host or operator interfaces um, and other real-time operating systems as well, um, such as VxWorks, provides device drivers um, in the middle whenever the lower level operating systems don't provide them, um, has um, standard network protocols as well as their own network protocols and uh, logging and monitoring of the industrial control systems. So Epix is a international worldwide project um, and it's mostly focused on high energy physics, particle accelerators, uh, kinds of platforms uh, and astronomy. And it was not designed with security in mind. Um, like most software that uh, emerged in the open source and scientific communities. Um, this is not like super important, but just to give you an idea of the architecture of an EPIX um, IOC. So uh, <clears throat> the, the IOC is just a kind of a generic term in epics for a computational node, essentially. Um, so it's an abstraction of a compute node um, and IOCs communicate with each other. So you can have um, RTEMS-based IOCs, VxWorks-based IOCs, Windows-based IOCs, right? So different hardware, software platforms that are encapsulated and then the middleware of epics uh, assumes it's running over IOCs. That, yeah. Um, and the basic functionality of this network is to manage um, PVs, process valuable variables. Um, so monitoring the industrial control system processes and then allowing you to control them. Um, and they communicate, IOCs communicate with each other uh, over this Epix channel access protocol. There's other variations of this protocol um, that have their pros and cons as well. Um, and this protocol inherently uh, trusts the other IOCs and has a fairly limited notion of security. Um, there's some kinds of access control and some kinds of additional capabilities you can add on top of it. One of the, one of the optional capabilities that's used at a lot of EPICS sites is called the PV gateway. So um, basically a, a gateway switch router, what have you, that connects your operator GUI side of the world to your SCADA non-GUI embedded side of the world. Um, that is a gross oversimplification, but um, gives an idea of what the gateway does. And um, it was not designed for security, although it does have some capabilities that can be leveraged to improve security. Um, such as some basic access control, some basic logging features. Okay, so that's kind of a high level view. We're going to talk about some of the different um, projects that we've been working on, particularly in, in, in this Epix world. Um, well, I guess, okay, yeah, um, we'll never be able to secure C and C++ software. <laughs> that, yeah, that, I'm, I'm going to just state that and just go out on a limb and risk risk my career there. Okay, um, there's a possibility, there's always a possibility of um, uh, of bugs, of software bugs creeping into projects. Okay, we know bug density, defect density exists um, and, and attacks are possible. So like big picture view, I just wanna give you a sense of the project um, is this is this is actually directly out of my um, proposal. I have this Gantt chart and like, Okay, I'm going to go out. We're going to we're going to change the world in three years with two graduate students and a postdoc. Um, well, okay, it's good to be ambitious. Um, I think uh, well, we're going to talk about each of these a little bit in pieces. Uh, aims one and two: security throughout the software development lifecycle and enhancing and leveraging operating system security services. I think these are like the cornerstone, like of the practical application of what I was trying to do. Um, analyzing and improving network security for the protocols, this ended up being a little bit more nebulous researchy stuff that hasn't really quite come out yet. Um, and we'll talk about that some more as well. And, and so we started in uh, October of 2018. Um, so here's October of 2019. 
and here is uh, February of 20, uh, okay, yeah, um, of 2020. So you know what, what happened here between Q1 and Q2 of year two, um, we had COVID. Now, besides that, I also moved between Q2 and Q3. So um, I, I relocated, we had COVID, it was okay. So. All right, so what have we done, or, or really what am I proud of what we've done? We've done a lot, actually. Um, some of our early work was able to static set up some static analysis tools for the open source software and to improve the integration of static analysis tools for both Artems um, and Epics. Uh, we haven't, yeah, okay. We do scanning of several of these tools. However, um, the, the sort of ability to take these scans and bring them into an open source ecosystem is kind of challenging. So um, there's still research that has to be done, I think, to make the automatic triage of reports from security analysis tools um, manageable for open source maintainers, um, especially for those of us who aren't paid to open source maintain. Um, the burden of dealing with triaging is um, it's untenable. It gets in the way of you know why we want to do the work, um, and so there there is again this right conflict, um, which everyone knows exists between sort of <clears throat> security and getting things done. Right. Just a sec. I have to call. There we go. All right, so we've done some work with getting security uh, static analysis integrated. Um, we do have regular static analysis running on a lot of the Artems components. We had static analysis running on Epics. Um, I lost track of that server. Um, I think other people have their own running as well. Um, and right now we're continuing to work on improving fuzz testing for Epics. So fuzzing um, epics software as well as its networking protocol stacks is something that um, we're actively working on improving um, and i'm going to talk a little bit more about that on a few slides here uh, there we go so uh, early work that was really successful with the fuzzing um, we basically got uh, American Fuzzy Lop, which is one of the open source fuzzing tools, kind of state of the art fuzzing tools to work on some of the software only um, models, IOCs in Epics. This worked pretty well and um, was able to produce crashes, which was interesting. Um, but we haven't quite gotten through to the ability to translate those crashes into narrow them down into bugs right and say okay this was a valid bug or no we actually provided an invalid input and you couldn't actually generate this input externally like that there's a difference between those um this this was a nice win for uh, a research experience for undergraduate student so an undergraduate student um set this up um took him maybe i don't know a couple months to to work through which is nice um but we haven't been able to quite push that through yet to sort of productionalize it i would say So uh, this is an architectural diagram, which is probably too complicated to understand anyway. Um, but, uh, oh, sh sh okay. I don't, I don't get my, I don't get my laser pointer anymore. That's okay. So um, this, uh, this is kind of a high level architecture of some research that one of my PhD students who's been supported on this project for quite a while has been um, building toward which is an infrastructure to better fuzz test stateful protocols or stateful systems really. So systems where the, the behavior of the system is dependent on the state it's in as well as its input and output. 
Whereas uh, a lot of existing fuzz testers assume a system is stateless and that you send it input, you get back output. It's kind of deterministic. It's kind of stateless. So um, cyber physical systems, real-time embedded systems have a lot of stateful responses, a lot of stateful behavior. Um, and, and the states are also n often non-deterministic. Um, and so there's a lot of challenges that are involved in fuzzing something that has a large state space and is non-deterministic. Um, and so we're working through how to do that. And hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have good results that we can share. Um, Click. There we go. So application of MechFix to the portable channel access server. Um, we're looking at fuzzing uh, channel access using some data sets that we've got and some small scale epics benchmark, sorry, benchtop setups that we've put together. Um, and then looking at ways to fuzz test and look for uh, inputs and states where we can push epics to crash. From that, then, we can either find there was a legitimate bug or find that there is even a, a potential vulnerability. Um, the open source community is interested in solving bugs. The people using Epics are in, interested in not having a security exploit. That, I think that's a fair way to put it. Um, and so that that's something that we're working on, is fuzzing um, different um, protocols implemented over channel access. <clears throat> Another big piece of this project has been focusing on improving the operating system security services. So in the proposal, we talked about establishing common cryptographic libraries and porting secure communication tools to um, IOCs. We actually found that probably the easiest way to do this was not to bring in cryptographic libraries or tools themselves, but to actually bring in a more secure networking stack. So when we when we got down to the business of actually doing this work, uh, we discovered, I guess we knew already, but discovered that uh, Epix was really pretty heavily reliant on an outdated uh, IP stack when it was used with um, with RTEMs. So um, it, it was a, a BSD-based uh, Ethernet stack, but pretty old and um, pretty uh, abused, I would say. We kind of cloned and owned it. We, we took the BSD networking stack, and then um, it was hacked to work, basically. Um, so we weren't really able to update it. We had some problems with trying to get new features added to it, and I'm sure there were latent security vulnerabilities that we didn't know about. So we call this the legacy stack now. Um, and I talked about that problem. Another problem it had is that um, it, it wouldn't support IPv6, which um, may or may not be a requirement of um, Epic's sites now or in the future. And so this was like an sort of the 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 killer need was we just have to get rid of this legacy stack and replace it with something newer for the newer features and hopefully better from a security perspective. So um, one of my PhD students looked at this problem and, and sort of formulated it as um, how do we encapsulate the network and treat the network stack as a library and build these libraries independent of each other so that people who still want to use the legacy stack can until we can wean them off of it uh, and provide them with a better state-of-the-art networking stack. And so we implemented this feature in RTEMS. And then we compared, you know, what, what did we do? We looked at the network latency of the legacy stack and the newer stack, which is called RTEMS LibBSD or LibBSD. So this is a state-of-the-art import of a free BSD networking stack that we actually track and update um, and stay closer to 
the released and maintained version of FreeBSD's networking stack. Okay, so the the performance of the LiveBSD is actually not as good, but it's not too bad um, compared to the Net Legacy. So there's more overhead involved in the larger, newer network stack. More features, more okay. Um, Although you can optimize it and get better performance, and you know we we get a lot more uh, non-functional um, benefits as well in, in terms of maintainability and security. <clears throat> now, one of the big problems we noticed when we did this work, however, is the size of the package, um, and these are in um, bytes, I believe. Um, so. Uh, just a, a simple bare bones, do nothing application implementing. I mean, it's got six bytes of okay data. We broke it out right into libraries. So the legacy stack was 250 megabytes, and the LiveBSD is 1.3 megabytes, which is a substantial difference when you're talking about microcontrollers that only have on the order of megabytes or even kilobytes worth of RAM. Um, actually, this might be, this is in kilobytes, not megabytes. Yes, kilobytes, sorry. 250 kilobytes versus 1.3 megabytes, right? 1,332 kilobytes. Okay, so um, something you could fit in 256K of RAM versus something that you couldn't even fit in one megabyte of RAM or ROM, as the case may be. Okay, so orders of magnitude different in size. So what we did is we looked at uh, LWIP as a promising approach. So LWIP uh, Lightweight IP is another open source networking stack, which is commonly used in embedded systems. Um, a lot of free RTOS products use LWIP with it. Um, so it's very commonly used in, in that domain. And so we looked at it and it has a size comparable to um, the legacy network stack. So we saw this and thought, okay, well, clearly LWIP is a pretty good alternative to offer for the smaller end um, microcontrollers, the smaller end embedded systems where the size constraints are closer to what um, users had with the legacy network stack. And so um, we provide that, we, we did the LWIP port to Artem's, um, it, it had been done before, but we, I would say, did it better. Um, we've provided an infrastructure now for using LWIP with Artem's and a way to easier port um, LWIP to new um, microcontrollers for Artem's. So this effort um, was a pretty major rework. We hadn't, we had not planned it in the first, like, like this was not part of my original proposal. Um, but I would say to date, it's probably the most significant thing we've done in this um, project. You know, we, we took the aging network infrastructure that was baked right into our Thames and we pulled it out into a separate um, area where we could easier age it out. So this was migration of about 275,000 lines of code. Um, and now this is a simpler process to upgrade networking stacks, um, to keep track of, um, to, to keep closer to LWIP and to better use LWIP uh, and to take advantage of others in the community, uh, in the RTEMS community who had been um, doing the LiveBSD um, port already for the higher performance and the, the newer features. Um, so we have this official RTEMS LWIP repository now with this infrastructure um, and others outside of our project are using and contributing to it. Um, so um, these are like the, the publications to date from this project. And I will say that this is not what I would have expected or anticipated from the size of the project. Um, I would have expected more, more publications, better publications. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. Um, so working with open source communities, um, which I've been doing now as part of my academic and um, um, hobbyist kind of uh, 
mindset for, I guess, about, oh, almost 15 years now. Um, there, there's 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 a lot of quirks I will say to working with open source communities. Each open source community is a little different because um, communities are always different. So if you want to work with an open source community um, and you want to do research, especially, um, or you want to help with their security, you really have to engage the community early and keep in touch with them often. Um, I was already heavily engaged with RTEMS. Um, I was interested in working with epics. Um, and so it, it was, you know, someone something where I had a foot in the door from a developer standpoint. And so I could approach this problem of security or research um, with my sort of developer maintainer hat on, which helps a lot. If you're coming in blind, you are it, it, that's a huge risk and you're not likely to be successful, I will say. Um, you really have to get integrated first. Um, something else I learned, which I probably had a hint about and intuition about, but hadn't really fully internalized, different people react very differently when you talk about security with them. Um, uh, and, and open source communities, you know, because there's there, there's a huge diversity in open source communities, international diversity, um, diversity of thought, diversity of habit. Some people are very security aware and security conscious. Some people like reject security as something that is not only unnecessary, but unwanted. Um, they want, they, they say, okay, we want to be transparent and open and we don't want to hide anything and we don't want to, we don't care about protecting anything. Um, we just want to, we just want to share everything with the world. Um, and, and working within that type of diverse community can be a little challenging. Um, I didn't encounter the far extreme of we don't want security in this work. I have seen it in other open source communities, which is interesting. I wouldn't know how to address that. Like, I, it's a political problem then. Um, I'm not a politician. My mom told me I shouldn't be a politician. Um, she said I lack a filter. Um, so another thing I learned through this, which is, you know, pretty normal kind of research projects change and shift um, as you make discoveries or hit roadblocks or don't make discoveries that you anticipated. Um, but when you work with the open source communities, your R&D plans actually shift due to external pressures, which is a little different from normal academic research, uh, a little more closely aligned with industrial research. Um, so when you do industrial research, you may be working on a research project and then it just gets thrown in the wastebasket and you have to go do something else. When you're working with an open source community, it won't go in the wastebasket. It just may have a lot less value to that community um, when you're doing that research. Like the, the value of the research changes over time, the research outcomes to the community. Whereas the value to the academic researcher is in the publications. So you have to kind of make a choice in some sense. Do you want to work on research and development that contributes to the community or research and development that contributes to the academic culture, the academic community? Um, and that's that's not an easy choice to make. And it's something that I would encourage anyone working with open source communities as part of their research to think about very carefully. Um, and, and my recommendation is you have to strike a balance and you have to figure out what the right balance is for you. Um, and I don't know what the right balance is for me. Um, it's definitely an iterative process. Uh, I, I would almost call it a sort of closed loop. Okay. Um, choose your assessments carefully. So um, anytime you're working with a community, if you're going to there's there's a question between doing research with a community and doing research on a community. Um, 
And basically right away, as soon as I got this award from NSF, and I went back and looked and read my proposal carefully, because that's the first thing you do when you get an award is like, okay, what did I commit myself to do? Um, and, and I realized that part of what I had proposed was was kind of doing research on the community. And, um, and, and I kind of went and talked with a few people, talked with my program officer, came to the conclusion that I don't want to do research on the community. I want to do research with the community. And so we had to sort of reframe some of the research plan uh, in order to avoid too much of what looks like research on people, like doing surveys, getting to gathering opinions from people, um, and focusing only on public facing metrics that we could we could measure and report on. So when you're planning to do research with an open source community, I would encourage you to think carefully about what are the public outputs that you can use to measure success as opposed to perhaps private things that um, you may need to um, get permission to measure, consent to measure. And if you need to get consent, that means that you need to do an institutional review board because that's how you properly do research on a community. Um, and actually maybe like, I guess a year or so, maybe two years after I did this project, um, there was kind of a, a rather infamous um, project out of the University of Minnesota where a security researcher was doing research on the Linux community um, with security, and, and it it blew up. It, it blew up. Um, I don't have to talk about it because you can go and read about it if you want to. Um, but um, I I would say I'm I'm glad I thought carefully about the difference between research with a community and research on a community. <laughs> um, okay, so really coming back to the the previous earlier point I made about you know amorphous R&D plans and how your research changes. You want to collect needs statements or gap statements from the community when you're developing your proposal, which I did. But then you also want to stay in touch with the community to understand how those needs changes. Um, and then you want to look carefully at you know what are their needs and, and where have they perhaps already been solved. And, and it turns out that a lot of times the needs of open source communities are not novel research needs or novel gaps. These are known problems. They just haven't figured out how to adapt them to their community, um, which is a great opportunity for undergraduate and master's students to contribute, um, but not a great opportunity for PhD students normally to contribute to the community while doing something novel that they can publish. So you may have to spend some time to think very carefully about how to frame a novel problem that solves both or advances both the scientific contributions while allowing you to um, adapt known solutions to the open source community's problems um, which is a it is tricky yeah, but it is also doable um, so a, a lot i would say the majority of the contributions that I've had to RTEMS um, were kind of known things. Um, people had published them, they knew how to do them. Um, I brought them to RTEMS in the context of doing something else for my academic research. Um, so the trick is kind of figuring out what is the something else? What is the problem that you're solving where that tool um, is useful? Uh, so the modular networking, casting that as an interesting research problem was itself an interesting problem for us to solve. Uh, and we're doing that right now with looking at um, reboots. So um, making secure boot a feature of um, real-time operating systems, well, that's kind of known already. So we're looking at it from the concept of, okay, what about secure reboots? So now we have this kind of less well explored research area that solves a problem with security that gives us an opportunity to implement some basic infrastructure for secure boots. Um, 
on top of that. Um, okay, so um, this one, don't assign non-publishable work to graduate students. I, I would say this is, okay, don't assign it, but let them do it is how I would actually frame it. Um, so initially I thought all my students should, you know, get to have the same kind of experience I got, get engaged in open source, do some development. Well, it it's not for everyone, really. Um, it's not for everyone in the sense that, you know, it, it's not going to motivate, not everyone's going to be motivated to, to do that kind of work. And so um, if you don't have that motivation, um, there's so much overhead in working with open source communities um, that that lacking that motivation, you're just not going to do it. You're going to go off and do something more fun or interesting to yourself. So if you have a graduate student or any student who is motivated and interested in doing that work, great, let them do it. Um, but then you also have to keep track of how much are they allowing this time suck to keep them from doing productive publishable research. So you want to know, you want to try to understand what is and isn't publishable and where students are going. And for the non-publishable work, um, you may need, you may want to consider hiring professionals or working with undergraduate students. Um, I found working with undergraduate students was an excellent way to do non-publishable research or less publishable, I should say, um, or do it yourself. Um, I just bite the bullet, sit down and crank it out because um, personally, I will be 10 times more efficient than a student doing it. So if it's non-publishable, it just needs to get done. Um, I might just carve out some time to do it. And then the last um, point that I'll make is about uh, coordinated disclosure. Um, so when you're involved in an open source project and you have security concerns, you may end up being on the receiving end of a security disclosure from a security researcher. And so um, I, I would encourage anyone working in open source communities within sort of the leadership to understand what security vulnerabilities and um, security researchers coordinated disclosure looks like. Um, Security researchers should also understand how to do responsible or coordinated disclosure um, and, and setting up um, pathways to do that with, within the open source communities. That's something that we are looking at now um, because during the course of this project, we did have an external researcher come along and say, well, I've got this, uh, this disclosure that I'm gonna be making. And, and we're like, what? Um, and, uh, and they wanted our input. Now, it turned out what they found was they found a piece of our software, Artem specifically, that um, was from, I think, 2006 or something that was sitting on a repository so you could find it on a website. But there's no way anyone would ever have been encouraged to use it and probably wouldn't be using it unless they've been using it since 2006 in a fielded project, in which case um, disclosing it is probably not beneficial in some sense because the system is no longer being deployed. And so the only places it's deployed is where it's in the field. Um, and this is uh, this is a challenge for security researchers because you know they want to disclose their bugs, get their whatever props, um, and so there, there's no good answer to how to do coordinated disclosure, um, but you want to try to understand what the security researchers have actually found and whether or not it is a real problem for your open source community um, and or for prior users. Uh, in this particular case, we actually don't know that there's any users using it. Um, we don't think anyone's using it, and so it's not a big concern to us, uh, and it's kind of quietly gone away. I think the security researcher, I don't know what happened with it, but okay. Um, so this is some of my uh, lab. Um, my lab supervisor, Senna, she was the postdoc on this project um, and she's on the job market. <clears throat> Vijay and Uchenna are the two PhD students who have done a, a lot of the research that I presented today. Um, and then some of my other 
students. Um, this work was supported primarily by the NSF as well as the state of Colorado. Um, so I'll be happy to answer questions now and I'll turn over the screen back to you. So um, while you were talking about the lessons learned, we had a question come up um, regarding the objections to security. Are So are those who object nonetheless sharing information without providing a means of verification to their users? If so, isn't that a problem? Yeah, so um, what I've observed is that some people in some open source communities find the notion of security repulsive. That's what I've observed. Like their personality is, I do not like security. I hate security. Don't, we don't want secure because we don't, it's a, it's a very knee jerky thing. Um, so what, whether or not or how they they do use security is kind of a question to me. I, I suspect it's more of a, you know, that they, they philosophically don't understand what they're objecting to <laughs> is my intuition. Um, and so that's why I said it becomes a political problem. You, you have to make a decision among a group of people who don't all agree on the same things. And so you, you have to, um, figure out how decision making is done in that type of scenario, I guess. I don't, I don't know if that quite answered the question, but you know, anyone can chat it. Yeah, we'll let them uh, type in and, and let us know if it, if that was sufficient. Oh, they say yes, thanks. Okay, well, while um, I, I'm going to let people type if they have any more follow up questions, but I just wanted to go over a, a few community updates. First, our next webinar is in February the 27th, 10 a.m. Central. Our topic is uh, the security program for the National Institute of Health's Common Fund Data Ecosystem. And our presenter is Rick Wagner from UC um, San Diego. And then a couple of things coming up. So OmniSoc Con 2023 is going to be uh, February 21st through 22nd. I think today is the last, no, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing that up. I think, I think registration is still available. That's right. Registration is still available. So if you're interested in attending, please uh, look that up at um, omnisoc.iu um, events, omnisoc.com. And then later we've got Educause uh, security uh, professionals and uh uh, privacy uh, professionals conference. That's that's in May. That will be in Bellevue, Washington, in person. The calls call for proposals ends today, but I looked up on their website and it says that registration opens in March. So if those of you who are attending who want to go there, um, make sure you check up on that in March to register. And with that, let's do a last call for questions. Um, Gadara, I want to thank you so much for presenting. Um, do you have any other final thoughts? No, um, I always I always feel like if you don't have questions, either you did a really great job or a really terrible job. And uh, <laughs> oh, oh, we got um, a follow up here. <laughs> do I consider uh, input from uh, Open Source Foundation, OpenSSF? Um, so there's there's actually there actually is a lot of nice guidance um, on both how to deal with security and how to set up security um, teams in open source projects. Um, and, and I think that the Open Source Foundation does have some of that, as well as like thinking about threat models from open source perspective and those kinds of things. Um, and, and, and I have looked at those, and, and I generally agree with what they've said. I think the most important thing to sort of internalize is that every community is different and that you really do have to tailor any of my, much less anyone else's, um, suggestions for, for working with and doing security with open source communities um, with the specific culture of the open source community in mind. All right, so um, uh, Carl says thanks. Um, thanks everybody for um, attending this event. 
I will be uh, publishing the video and the slides probably later today. So if you are interested in sharing this with colleagues, you're welcome to do that. And with that, I want to say thank you, everybody, for coming. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.